So our family uh, actually attended another church for several years. The church wasn't meeting our needs as a family. And for a couple years, we searched for churches and went to many churches. Got to the point we didn't even want to go to a church anymore. Just a few couple short months ago, uh, we got up one Sunday morning. None of us really wanted to go anywhere. And almost as a sarcastic joke, I said, why don't we go to Chase Oaks? Uh, it's right down the street from our house. We, we came here not really expecting anything. We walked in the church and Natalie was the first person to greet us and uh, immediately uh, welcomed us and made us feel at home, showed us how to, where to check in our children, uh, it made us feel very welcome and we immediately started getting deeper into this church and we've been here and it's, it's become a home for us. As you can see here at Chase Oaks, we are all about creating a come as you are environment and Natalie makes that happen every single week here at Woodbridge and that's why Natalie is our hero. <clears throat> yeah, way to go, Natalie, and everybody who serves in all kinds of ways to make Chase Oaks happen, to do what God has called us to do in this community and in the parts of the world he's carved out for us to be engaged in. Uh, thank you. And what I love about that story, I love a lot of things about it, but one of the things I love about that story is that Natalie, as a person who greets, who creates a welcoming environment, has had no idea the rest of the story. Like you just greet somebody, create a welcoming environment. You have no idea how that's going to help somebody take new steps and deeper steps and more steps with God. But that's what God does. We never know the whole story. God does. We get to be part of it. Um, it's really cool. Uh, Friday night after the service, I, I talked to a person the first time in our church. And he said, you know what? I kind of get the idea that this church is for anybody. And I was like, that's Great, that's perfect, because that's exactly right. There's no, you know, you don't have to measure up. There's no anything, like it is a church for anybody, absolutely, to come as your church. And so we're glad that you're here, whoever you are, uh, that you came, that you showed up um, today. And whatever campus you're at, at Chase Oaks, or if you're online right now, um, thanks for being with us. So today, we are in, we continue this series in the Old Testament book called Judges. And when you think judges, don't think like Judge Wapner or Judge Judy or something like that at a courtroom. It's more, the, it's another word for leader. It's a Hebrew word. It could be translated leader. And so it's these leaders that God raises up. Now, it, it shows us the kind of people God uses. And there's a couple things the book is about. One is the, the cycles. Greg did a great job introducing the book. He talked about this cycle that the nation was in over and over again for a couple hundred years. And the cycle, I'll just simplify it because we all experience it as something like this, because um, you and I have done this too, where we're kind of cruising through life, life's going okay, and, uh, and then something happens where it's not okay. We get a bad report from the doctor of us or someone we care about, or uh, we have a relational pr relationship problem or a job problem, or we lose a job, a financial problem. And all of a sudden, we, we have no problem reminding ourselves to pray more. Like we're just praying, right? Because we know we need God and we, and we feel that. We're all about God. And we bar bargain with God during that time, right? God, if you would just do this, then I'll be like the best Christian ever. I'll, you know, smoke everybody. I mean, I'll just be awesome. And, and then God does show up. God does bring an answer. And we're that way for a little bit. We kind of stay focused and all that. But over time, we just have this tendency as humans when we don't feel that same need for God to kind of drift back into the way that we were before until something happens again. And so that's essentially the cycle of the nation is in. They're, uh, they're just kind of cruising through, not really that focused on God. In fact, get, there's idols and all that with neighboring nations they get into, and then they get in trouble, they experience pain, they go back to God, God, we need you. God raises up a deliverer to rescue the nation. They stay focused on God for a little while and then just go right back to kind of doing what they were doing before. And that cycle repeats over and over again. So that's one thing the cycle, I mean, the book of Judges is about. The next thing is really the, the kind of people that he raises up, the kind of leaders, the kind of these people called judges. It was the leaders of the nation before they were called kings and queens. The kind of people that God uses. And you might think, because the, the, really the rest of the book is about, it's kind of organized around the stories of these people, like uh, Deborah this week, um, next week Gideon, Jephthah, Samson, so on, that this is really a book about people power and the kind of people that God uses in a sense that we should emulate these people. They're like role models. We need to be like them. 
But the more you read the book, the more you realize, no, we do not need to be like most of them. They're, they're not, I mean, this is Ordinary Heroes, the series is called. Some of these people are way underneath ordinary. They're, some of them are just not even good people, like Samson that we're going to see uh, toward the end. In fact, it, the, more, the more the story goes, the worse they get. Now, Deborah, the one we're focused on today, is actually a role model. Uh, she was the best of all the judges. She actually is somebody. You'd say, you know, I need to emulate her. And that's cool. But after that, it kind of goes downhill from there. So really, it's a story of God power. But it is how God uses ordinary and even subordinary, deeply flawed people to do what he does. It's how God uses ordinary, flawed, broken, messed up. Man, I've messed up so much. It's God. That's the people he chooses to use in a powerful way. And the invitation is there for all of us. And that's cool. And if we just stop there and say, oh man, God uses people like us, ordinary people, no matter you know, how we messed up or not or whatever, that's great, but that doesn't go far enough. Meaning we can think, well, God, you know, used ordinary people. Oh, that's so cool. They like me. That makes me feel good, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to hug me right now. I'm just going to hug myself. But God won't use you because you're ordinary. That, that's the point of today. God won't use you because you're ordinary. He'll use you because you show up. You got to show up, meaning you have to take a scary step toward his mission. The invitation is there for everybody, anybody. God wants to use you. He wants to bring hope into hopelessness, light into darkness, knowledge of how people can know God where they don't realize it, and what God's done to make that possible. He, he calls us all to be part of what he is doing in this broken and dark world, making it better, making a difference. And there's nothing like it when God uses you that way, but you have to show up. It's not just being ordinary. I mean, most people God doesn't use because they don't show up. And to the extent that you and I show up is the extent that we get to be used by God to be part of what he's doing in the world. And so therefore today is really an opportunity for all of us to say, God, where do you want me to show up? Maybe the first time, or where do you want me to show up in a deeper way or in a new way? Because every one of us in the room, whatever room you're in right now, our life will be, at the end of it, in part, a story of missed opportunity. Some a lot of missed opportunity, some a little missed opportunity. And I don't want my life to be a missed opportunity story. And I don't think you do either. And so it really is an opportunity today, a chance to just stop and say, okay, God, how do you want me to show up? So it's an important, important day and a cool story. It's also because uh, this first judge, this first leader is a girl, uh, a woman named Deborah. It is kind of a girl power story too. And um, actually there's two women in the story that are used in a really, uh, by God, a really powerful way. And, and the story is structured that way to, to emphasize that. So it really is how God doesn't just use everybody, he does, who show up. But in particular, as we'll see, uh, is, this is a girl power story. And it comes at a great day because I don't know if you realize it, but today is International Women's Day. And yeah. And what that means is uh, it's a day that we stop to celebrate the accomplishments of women in our culture and in our world and to advocate for gender equality, which is a biblical and good thing. And uh, so if you just, even if you are a girl or woman, if you see another uh, girl or woman around you, don't, don't do the, I was going to do high five, but you may have some, you know, we may all have viruses, who knows? So just, uh, just kind of give them the thumbs up. Just say, all right, you know, from a distance. But um, anyway, so today we're going to see that too. It's a really cool story and let's jump into it. After Ehud's death, now Ehud was the judge before Deborah. We don't know a whole lot, know much about him. The story's kind of short. We do know he was left-handed. Any left-handed people out there? Yeah, Ehud's your, Ehud's your man right there, Ehud. Uh, after Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So they go through the cycle. They're in trouble. They cry out to God. He raises up Ehud as a deliverer. They're all about God for a little bit after the deliverance, and they just go right back to what they were doing before. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera. Now, he's another main character, kind of boo. There we go. Yeah, he's a bad guy. Who had 900 iron chariots and ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. 
Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Why? Because they were in trouble. And now they're all about God. That's the cycle. So they are in trouble. For 20 years, Sisera uh, reigns with, this, with his army controlling everything in a, a terrorism kind of way. I mean, they, they're afraid to go outside. They quarantine themselves. You ever heard about people doing that? And, uh, and just because of the danger out there. And so they cry out to God for help, and God raises up a deliverer, uh, one of these people, one of these judges we're talking about, in this case, Deborah. Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, uh, some of you uh, may be expecting a baby and you're wondering about baby names, and, uh, and you, could be, you could maybe be the only person in America with a baby named Lapidoth, just something to consider. Um, email me if you go for it. Uh, was a prophet who was judging Israel at that time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. So Deborah was uh, an amazing person. Um, she was both prophet and judge, prophet and leader. You could call it president, whatever you want to call it, the judge thing. So she was both the leader of the nation and the prophet to the nation. Now, prophet was arguably the most important person in, in Israel at the time, God's people in the Old Testament era, um, because the prophet was the one that God spoke to, gave, gave revelation and guidance to for the whole nation. So the role of prophet was a really big deal. And Deborah was the prophet that God chose, uh, or was the person God chose to be the prophet. She was also the president. She was also the leader. Now, being both of those things was extremely rare. I can only think of one other person in the, in the Old Testament that had both of those jobs at the same time through the whole story of Israel. So she must have been a, a truly amazing person. Now, I do remember hearing a sermon back when I was in college, some uh, pastor gave where he talked about this. He was preaching this passage, and he said this. Uh, he said, so, you know, God chose a, a, a woman, Deborah, to be both the prophet and the leader because the, in the time of Judges, it was so evil that there were no godly men for the job, so God had to choose a woman. Yeah, you can boo. Um, that's a bozo pastor, and sometimes we get there, you know, and that happens. But that, that, is not what's, that, that is not what's going on here. Um, there were, we're going to see another godly man here in a little bit in the story. It's not like there wasn't any, you know, oh, man, I, I got to use a woman. That's not the deal. God chose Deborah because he called Deborah and gifted Deborah for these two roles. She was, got the job because she was the best person for the job. And that's important to understand. And it does raise a question about God and the Bible and women and leadership and the Old Testament and the church because there's different roles and what is all that about. And so let's talk about that just a little bit, kind of do a little bypass from this story. And I'm going to give a, re I've just got a few minutes to do this, so I don't have time to be exhaustive and go to every little passage, some of which are tricky. Really, all I have time to do is get in a lot of trouble. But I haven't been in trouble in two weeks because I didn't speak last week. So let's, uh, let's do this. So how do, what is the deal with God and the Bible and women and all that? So here it is. So in the, um, from the very first page of the Bible, we get the most important reality about God and women and how he views women and the role of women and all that, is on the very first page of the Bible, we're told that God created man um, in his image, both male and female. So both men and women are created equally in the image of God, have equal value, dignity, worth, capability, capacity, all of that. Um, and then in the New Testament, it's even made a little bit stronger when Jesus comes around that in Jesus, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. So there's, if you wonder about gender equality, yes, in the Bible, God, that's how God, views. we're all made in God's image, all one in Christ. Uh, you also, we also, it's important to understand, and we know this, that equality um, doesn't mean that we're all the same, like, right? And there's differences, still differences between these people, but in terms of value and worth and all that, there's equality. And equality doesn't mean equivalency is another way to say that, I guess. I mean, I don't, this may be news to you, but, but men and women are different from each other. And all you have to do is go spend about five minutes in preschool right now, and I bet you'll see that, you know, that men and women are different. That's a good thing. I'm thankful for that, at least as a man, because... 
I, I kind of, you know, I'm glad Christy's different than me. And that's a good thing. And, they're different, and there are different roles in, in the world and different roles in the, in the Old Testament and New Testament for women. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, in the Old Testament, there was, there, you see women, uh, you know, using their leadership just all over the place. And there are three big roles at, at the very top of the pyramid, of the leadership pyramid in the Old Testament. It's prophet, priest, and king. So prophets, like we said, were the spokesmen for God, arguably the most important of the three. And as we see, Deborah was a prophet, and there were lots of women prophets in the Old Testament. So that was a role that God called women and men to. Um, the role of king, same way. You have kings and queens. Deborah played both. She was the judge. She was the president. She was, in a sense, the queen at the time. Um, I mean, they will actually have kings and queens in Israel after the time of the judges, but they call them judges during this period. So both, you know, prophet, priest, king, um, prophet and king, or prophet and judge, uh, were women and men who served. Priest was the one that God, for whatever reason, reserved for men. And not just any men, but male descendants of Aaron, the very first priest. And so women did all kinds of leadership stuff, but that one role in the Old Testament for whatever reason, I don't make the rules, was reserved for men. When you get it in the New Testament, it's pretty similar to that um, in the sense that you see women in the church doing everything. I mean, just teaching, profiting, uh, I mean, being a prophet, uh, you know, doing all this stuff. And, um, but there's one role that when you look at the biblical story, it stipulates you have to choose men for this role, kind of like the priests in the Old Testament. It's the role of elder. And not just any men, but men with certain character qualities. But even then, um, elders' wives are mentioned too because the way God set up the New Testament church was not so much around a business model, corporate model, but around the family, around the family model. So um, elders are men who serve with their wives, and there's a role for both. It's like mom and dad of the family, and they each have it. So at Chase Oaks, we take that literally. We have, uh, so at Chase Oaks, the one, the role of elder, which are men who serve with their wives if they're married to uh, lead our church. Uh, together from that perspective. And underneath their authority, we encourage women to do everything, every other thing, like in, in, including pastor. And not every church has, we have women pastors and men pastors, and not every church has that. And so some of you, if you're new to church, you're like, why are we even talking about this? But if, you're, if you've been around church for a while, then I don't know what kind of church you've been from, but for sometimes that's new. Hey, you have women pastors doing everything, and what's that about? Well, in the, in the New Testament story, um, they didn't use the word pastor to describe, that wasn't a title for somebody, like we do it now. That wasn't a role in the church. Uh, there's, in Ephesians 4, pastor, teacher, two words combined together are a gift, like a spiritual gift, an ability that God gives people, but it wasn't a title. There were two titles of leaders in the Bible, uh, in the church, that were emphasized. And it doesn't mean wrong, it's wrong to use pastor, it's just, it, that's just not what would have happened 2,000 years ago. They used two terms, they used elder, that we've talked about in deacon and deaconess. So there are girl deacons and boy deacons that are singled out. Um, and for us, that's what staff is. That's what pastors are. And feel like that's where it fits because um, the past deacons are ones who, uh, underneath the authority of the elders, run the church, uh, kind of administer the ministry of the church. And so therefore, that's, that was for deacons and deaconesses. We call them pastors and you could call them pastoresses, I guess. Um, and therefore, our, our girl, guy and girl pastors who are, there, there's no difference. I mean, you can, women pastors, men pastors, what they do. So we'll have, you know, women pastors who are campus pastors as we go. We'll have women pastors as teaching pastors. The one role that we would, that would be different, the only pastoral role for us, the way we're trying to work it out, is the senior pastor role because in our model, senior pastor is also an elder. So if I get run over by a bus or something, and some of you have been praying about that for a long time, you want a new pastor. And well, if you, prayer gets answered, then I'll probably get replaced by a dude unless we change our theology. But other than that, you know, it's fair game. And, uh, and encourage, I mean, really, people encourage to serve uh, just the best person, uh, male, female, because God's gifted all of us to be leaders and to, and to be engaged and to serve. And hey, there are other churches that work that out differently um, and feel differently about it. It is less than clear 
Uh, and so there's good people who disagree, even if you agree that, yeah, the one role, that elder role is guy, men, they serve with their wives. Even if you agree with that, how exactly the rest of it plays out, churches will have a little different because we're all just trying to work it out. And so don't, we're just trying to do the best we can. So don't throw rocks at other churches that see it a little differently. And if people throw rocks at us, ouch, but we're just trying to do the best we can. That makes sense? All right. So with that in mind, all that to say, the reason God chose Deborah wasn't because she was plan B. She was plan A. She was God's person for that role, for that time. He gifted her, called her to be both prophet and the judge, prophet and the leader. Israel's in trouble. He asks her to lead the charge to fix it. But she's a good leader. She knows she can't do it by herself. And so she's going to approach Barak, who is the general of the army. Some of the other judges were uh, the general of the army as well as the leader of the country. She wasn't. So she's going to approach him with a word from the Lord. She's a prophet. And so she approaches the, the military leader, a guy named Barak. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor. And I will call out Sisera, commander of Jamin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. So he has a word, she has a word from the Lord for him. Now I don't know if that's ever happened to you where somebody says, I have a word from the Lord for you, or God told me to tell you. Has anybody ever done that? Um, if, and, and that happens to me because I'm a pastor, so probably 10 times a year that kind of thing will happen where somebody will say, I've got a word from the Lord for you. I remember when I was in college I, 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 and I talked to somebody who was a girl who had a guy approach her in this Christian ministry thing that said, God told me to tell you that you're going to be my wife one day. That was like his pickup line. And she's like, well, you may want him to tell me too because uh, I'm not sure that's you know, buying it. And God never told her and they're not married. Uh, and that was a long time ago. But when that happens to me, um, I, I mean, if, I consider the source. You know, so if, if it's somebody that I don't know or maybe, you know, it's just not a very respectable person for whatever reason, I'll still listen to it. I'll still take it to God. But that's a little different than if it's somebody that I know, somebody that I respect a lot, somebody who's godly, somebody who's mature. If one of those kind of people says, hey, I really believe God wants me, I'm going to listen to that. In fact, this January, one of our elders' wives, you know, we talk about how we lead uh, as couples. One of our elders' wives uh, met with me and said, hey, I, I, I'm scared to do this, but I, I really believe God wants me to have this conversation. I really think this is something. That, and I mean, and it was, it was life-changing for me. I'll be forever grateful that she showed up and, and did that. And so he, uh, Barak, takes it the same way because he respects Deborah. He knows she's the prophet. And so he's going to say yes to this, but he's going to say yes with a caveat. Barak told her, I will go with you, but here's the caveat, but only if you, Deborah, go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you. And then this prophecy. But you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over sister will be at the hands of a woman. Again, the girl power today, right? And now remember that prophecy. That's going to come up again later. But what does he say? He said, I'll go with you, but only if you go with me. Which causes some people to, when they tell this story or when they look at this, to, to think that what was going on here is that Barak was basically being a weenie. Uh, that he was so scared, he's like, I'll go, but only if you go with me to hold my hand because I'm too scared, you know, you need to go with me. And that he really wasn't a person of great faith, he was a weenie. And uh, that's not what's going on in the story. Uh, one way we know that is in Hebrews 11 in the New Testament, it looks back at Old Testament people and picks some of them out as examples of great faith. And it picks out both Deborah and Barak as a team. It doesn't say, well, Deborah was really, you know, had a lot of faith, but Barak was a big weenie. It doesn't say that. It says they were both people of great faith. And some of you are like, well, he stopped saying weenie. And I will. Uh, <laughs> just, you know, one more time. Um, I don't think he was a weenie. I think he was wise. And here's why. Because what God told him to do was crazy. What God told him to do at a human level made no sense. And a military strategy was a disaster of a plan. At first, I mean, but let me just explain that. So 10,000 troops, get 10,000 troops to face Sisera's army. That sounds like a lot, except Sisera had 40,000 troops. That's not good odds, just if you stop there. But it gets worse. So Sisera's army were like professional soldiers. They were like trained people. 
He was gathering together. Most of these people were farmers and stuff. He, they weren't trained soldiers. Not only that, Sisera's army was way better equipped. This was the beginning of the Iron Age where people were starting to use steel weapons, steel swords, and all that kind of stuff. And we know from the book of Judges that the other nations tended to have those and Israel did not, which was a huge disadvantage. Not only that, Sisera's army had 900 chariots, iron chariots. Israel didn't have any. Well, that was a really big deal because a chariot in that era would just mow through infantry like a hot knife through butter. It would just take out hundreds and hundreds of people. With one chariot would be scary. 900 chariots, multiply that times 900, would be devastatingly terrifying to look across the battlefield and see that. Not only that, God tells him, do it in the Kidron River Valley, which means this big open area, this big open plain, which if your enemy's advantage is chariots, you don't want big open area. Like you want to be on a mountain or rocky area, something like that. So this was a really bad idea at a human level. And so he just knowing that says, look, the only way we're going to have a chance is if God shows up. If God shows up, we'll win. But he's got to show up. You're the prophet. You're the one with the hotline to God. I want to make sure we do this right. You got to come with us. She says, okay. And then the day of the battle comes. And they gather these 10,000 troops. Imagine being those troops A bunch of farmers, ill-equipped, looking over to real army, four times bigger, iron chariots, iron weapons, and it'd be terrifying, except God shows up. And you know what happens when God shows up in a battle? He wins. His batting average is 1,000. He doesn't lose. He doesn't know how. And he shows up, and he wins. And and the way he does it, it's definitely a God thing. These ordinary people, it's not about them. It's about what God does through ordinary people who show up. What happens is God sends these flooding rains that floods the Kidron River. It makes that whole river valley this big muddy mess. And the one place where chariots are no good is in the mud. They get stuck. They get bogged down. And that's what happens. It creates this panic in the army. They get so freaked out because they're used to counting on their chariots. They just start running away. And uh, Barak's army chases them, destroys the army. So it's an incredible victory. But it's incomplete because one person gets away. Sisera. Remember when you booed Sisera? The general. He was an evil guy, a powerful guy, a cunning guy, smart guy. He's just going to rise up again. And so that would be a problem, but God's going to deal with him. And that's where, we, if you remember the prophecy before, remember the prophecy, but you will receive no honor in this venture, venture for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. Deborah wasn't actually talking about herself. She was talking about another woman. A, a, a lady named Jael. And, uh, and we're going to see how God uses Jael here in a minute, but understand, Sisera, we booed because he was a bad guy. Well, one of the ways he was, he was a bad guy in a lot of ways, but he was also, we, we learned this from chapter five, where Deborah uh, writes this song to commemorate the story. We get more details about it, about what happened in chapter four, is that Sisera was a, a massive abuser of women. And he saw women as his own sexual objects. And so when he came in and conquered, or he came into an area that he already conquered, and he saw a girl, um, he would just uh, basically kidnap her, rape her, and keep her to continue to do that. I mean, there are millions of people in that kind of of environment now in uh, sex, sex trafficking. And he was at the top of the bad list when it came to the Me Too kind of thing. I mean, he was a bad guy. And I don't think it's accidental that God chose a woman to bring justice to an abuser of women. And here's how it happens. So Sisera is running for his life. His army's been defeated. He knows these people are out to get him. He's got to find a place to hide. He's exhausted. He's worn out. He's freaking out. And he gets so excited because he sees this tent of a person that he knows, and it's a buddy of his. It's an ally of his. And he's like, ah, I'm safe. I can hide here. However, the guy, his buddy, isn't there. His buddy's wife is, J.L. And here's what happens. J.L. went out to meet Sisera and said to him, come into my tent, sir, come in, don't be afraid. So he went into her tent and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said. I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk from a leather bag, which would have been an upgrade from milk, and covered him again. Stand at the door of the tent, he told her. If anybody comes and asks if there's anyone here, say no. 
But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and tent peg in her hand. And then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, pegged him to the ground. And I love this little phrase, like we needed it. And so he died. Uh, That will tend to happen if this happens. Don't try this at home. This is not going to go well. And uh, I mean, what a way to die, death by tent peg, you know? Um, And there is a moral to this story, actually a couple of lessons from this story that you can get. Here's one. Uh, Be careful when people give you free drinks that you don't get hammered. Um, That's a good life lesson. You don't don't get that from every church. Uh, Here's another one for guys. If you sleep with women who aren't your wife, you may end up with a pounding headache. Uh, Don't do it. Um, Okay, so that's not the real moral of the story. But what is the real moral of the story is how God uses people like JL, like Deborah, like Barak, like the 10,000, ordinary people. I mean, Deborah was extraordinary, but ordinary people who showed up. And because they did, here's what we read at the end of the story. Then there was peace in the land for 40 years. Change everything with a portion of people who are willing to show up. And they got to be part of the victory. Now, Deborah's going to talk about that more because in chapter 5, like I mentioned briefly, chapter 4 is the story. Judges chapter 5 is a song that Deborah writes to commemorate the story, to honor God and to honor these people who showed up. And Deborah was one of these people that just must be good at everything. I mean, she was like the prophet. She was the leader. And I mean, you almost hate her. She's so good at everything. Because, and then she writes songs. Like she's a musician too. And she does. She writes this song. And we don't know the tune. And I wouldn't sing it if I did because you wouldn't like that. But she writes this song and it honors God. But it also gives us some more details. And one of the things it tells us, I think it's verse 9, is that all these 10,000 people, they were all volunteers. Nobody was coerced. They all showed up willingly. They were all volunteers. Now, that would have been a crazy thing to volunteer for. And even to stay there when you look across the battlefield and you see 40,000 troops and 900 chariots and you're like in real weapons and all that. And you're like, what did I just sign up for? I didn't know what kids own meant. I, I didn't know there was two-year-olds or whatever it is. Like it just, you know, when people sign up at church. But you just say, ah, you know, what am I doing here? You know, this is a bad idea. But they, they showed up. And, um, and because they showed up, God used them. They got to be part of it. But not everybody showed up. Most people didn't. And Deborah calls out those who did and those who didn't in the song. So Israel was divided into families, divided into tribes, 12 tribes. And here's what we learn um, in the song. She said, this is part of that song. She calls out those who did show up and those who didn't. The princes of Issachar, that's one of the tribes of Israel, were with Deborah and Barak. And they followed Barak, rushing into the valley. But in the tribe of Reuben, another one of these families, there was I mean, and when I say families, this is like massive amounts of people. Um, There was great indecision. Why did you sit at home among the sheepfolds to hear the shepherds whistle for their flocks? Yes, in the tribe of Reuben, there was great indecision. They didn't show up. They stayed with their sheep. Gilead, another one of these tribes, remained east of the Jordan. They didn't show up. And why did Dan stay home? The tribe of Dan didn't show up. Asher sat um, unmoved at the seashore, remaining in his harbors. They didn't show up. But Zebulun, that tribe, risked his life, as did Naphtali, that tribe on the heights of the battlefield. Some people did show up, most people didn't. Now think about it a little bit. Those people, those tribes that didn't show up, at the beginning of the story would have looked really smart. They had a lot of reasons not to show up. It would have felt crazy to take that scary step. They would have looked at those who did show up as the Dumbos. But after the victory, it totally reversed. Right? Because those who didn't show up would be defined by that for the rest of their life as those who didn't show up, those who didn't share the victory, those who didn't come when they were called. And that'd be the biggest regret of their life. Those who did show up, this would be the highlight of their life. It may have felt really 
you know, not so great at the beginning, but after the victory and what they saw, how God, what God can do through ordinary people, and it really is about God and what he does, they would have been forever grateful that they showed up. It would be the highlight of their life. It would be the thing that they would tell their children and their grandchildren that I got to be part of this. And when you show up, when God calls you to show up, God always has the victory because he can't lose. And it, and it just, that was their choice. And those who chose well would have been forever grateful. The others missed opportunity. And the same thing is true for you and me 3,000 years later. God has called you and me out to be part of what he is doing in this world. And he's gifted us and he's allowed us to experience certain things that he wants to use to minister in this world, in this church, in this community, at your work. I mean, he's called us to be part of what he's doing in our world. And there's all kinds of reasons not to show up. And that's why most people don't. But to those who do show up, get to be used by God and see the victory. See, in the New Testament era, it's church that God has chosen to use. Church is just you and me. It's people. In fact, when we hear the word church, it's easy for us to think of a church building or maybe an event. Did you go to church this weekend? You know, yeah, I did. Or no, I didn't or whatever. Um, and that, it's not an event. It's not a building. Church is a movement of people called out by God for mission. That, that's what church is. In fact, the word that we in the New Testament translated church is a Greek word, uh, ekklesia. Ecclesia literally means those who are called out, the called out ones. That if you're part of a church, you're here, not by accident, you're here because God called you out. God chose you. He drafted you to be on the team. I mean, I think even if you're here for the first time, you're like, hey, hold up, dude, I, I'm just seeing if I, you know, about whole God, Bible, Jesus thing is even a real thing. Um, I get that, but I don't think you're here by accident. I mean, you could disagree with me, but I, I think you're here because God wanted you to be here and he wants to know you and he's pulling you toward himself. I really do. And for those of us who are here, who are part of this, we're not just here by accident. We're right here right now because God called us to be here right now to be part of what he's doing in our community, to be part of what he's doing in the world through this group of people called Chase Oaks Church. And you and I can either shrink back or we can move forward. We can either not show up or show up. That's always our choice. And to the extent that you and I show up is the extent to which we get to be used by God to share in the victory, to be part of what he's doing in this broken world, bringing light. And so I, you know, as you think about that, I don't know where you're at, you know, right now. And you think, man, am I, you know, I think it's a great question to ask God, what, it, what would it look like for me to show up more, show up bigger? Because that's how God works. He uses ordinary people to do his work. That's the, way he, that's the way he resources his mission. I mean, he could have done it so much more efficiently than he does, but he chooses to use us. Like resourcing the mission, I'm talking about, well, how does that happen? How does he resource? The way he chose to do that is through people. That he gives us the financial resources we have that we think are ours, but they're not. They're his as a stewardship, the Bible says. And he asks us to prayerfully decide to say, you know, I'm going to honor God. I'm going to have a generosity-driven life, not a consumption-driven life. And I'm going to, what the Bible teaches is to say, I'm going to set aside the first percentage of my income, and I'm going to give it. And I'm going to give it to resource what God is doing in the world through the church. And if you wonder why all this stuff happens, it happens around here, it's because there's a lot of people who do that, who show up that way financially, who say, I'm going to give the first percentage of my income. And I'm going to, I mean, and, and for those of us who do, it's an incredible privilege. And, and what we realize once you start doing that is that what God says is actually true. That not only will we be rewarded for eternity for that, but we actually, he actually, we invite his enablement and his blessing into that part of our life. When we honor him that way, we, he, then we're not on our own. He actually shows up in a powerful way when we do that. And, and yet that's a, it's easier not to, which is why most people don't. But it's a choice. You can either do it or not, but the opportunity is there. Same thing with serving, right? With using our gifts and abilities to minister, to create these environments at all of our campuses for children and, and youth and adults and, and these services and groups and all that where people can come as they are, be transformed, and then together make a difference alongside our community partners. All those are, are there's opportunities to show up. 
And it's right there in front of you. And the ones God will use aren't just ordinary people, but ordinary people who show up. And I think it's, a, it's just a great time today to ask God, God, how do you want me to show up? How, how, what step do you want me to take? And it may be a new step. It may be a bigger step. I don't know. Um, if you go to our website, uh, you'll see a join a team if you go in our church app just to make that easy. And it'll tell you about all our different teams, both in our church as well as our community partners uh, serving a community and how you can join and, and just prayerfully, I challenge you to prayerfully look at that and just say, God, what are you calling me to do to show up? Or you can talk to somebody at, in, in the lobby at the guest area about serving. Uh, that's great too. And for those of you who are in northwest of where I am right now, up in the three, um, 380, is it right? 380 Prosper area up in there. It is 380. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know why that left me, but um, kind of the 380 Custer area, that general area is where we're prayerfully uh, planning to start a campus later this year. And if you're in that area, it's a great time to show up, to say, I want to be part of that team to reach my neighborhood, reach my neighbors, serve my neighbors, all that. And, uh, and I hope you'll dive into that opportunity. That also means it's kind of an all hands on deck on, for, a church, for our church every time we start campuses, because it means our existing campuses, there are a bunch of people who go to start that campus, which opens up all kinds of opportunity, right? So let's all be praying, okay, God, in this season, let's, let's show up. And, uh, and, and we're going to go to God with that in prayer. Prayer is just talking to God. We're going to go and just say, God, how do you want me to show up? Either maybe for the first time or maybe show up in a new way, in a broader way. I don't know, God, I'm yours. Whatever it means, with everything I have, I just want to be a person who shows up. I don't, want to be my, I don't want my life to be missed opportunity. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to be faithful. I want, I want you to use me. And we're going to go to God with that prayer. It's a dangerous prayer, but a really good one. And before we do, though, since it is International Women's Day, this is a girl power story, I do want to say this to all of you women in our church, and that is thank you. Uh, thank you for all the ways you show up at your work, in your home, in your neighborhood, in this church, uh, everywhere you are, thank you for all the ways you show up and, and where God is using you to make everything better. You're awesome, and we thank you. Um, and now all of us, guys and girls, let's, uh, let's bow our heads before our Heavenly Father. And again, prayer is just talking to God. He's our Father. He loves us. He just wants us to talk to Him. You don't have to use special words or have somebody say them for you, just talk to them. And, I, and this is a dangerous prayer, but I'm gonna encourage you to say it. Just say in your heart, God, where do you want me to show up bigger? And, and whatever he speaks in your life, just say, okay, God, I'm gonna take that nudge from you and, and just help me be bold enough to take that step. And Father, I thank you that you choose to do what you do through ordinary people like us. I know it'd be way easier if you just skipped us. But you don't. And you don't have a plan B. Like, this is what you do. You use people like us, collected in churches like us, just very imperfect people, very imperfect churches, to do your work in this crazy world. And we thank you that we get to be part of the victory. In Jesus' name, amen.